Good afternoon. I now call to order the May 20th meeting of the Curriculum and Instruction Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum and instruction committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Cox if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Pastor? Present. Mr. Rothman? Present. Dr. Hager? Present. Ms. Mack? Present. Mr. Mahomza? Okay. He will be absent today. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cox, will you now please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Wistad. Present. Dr. Parandozzi. Present. We also have Ms. Kraft. Present. Dr. Wolf. Present. Ms. Wicks. Present. Dr. Boyer. And Mr. Kearns. Present. Okay, thank you and welcome to all of you. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, um, Dr. McComas is not with us this afternoon. She is at her daughter's graduation. Yay! <laughs> so today, I'm um, joining us in uh, leadership with this meeting is Ms. Shea. So with that being said, I'm going to ask Ms. Shea to get us started. And thank you, Ms. Shea, for taking on this task. My pleasure, thanking you. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity, Ms. Pastor. Um, we have a packed agenda today with lots of wonderful presentations as well as some items for approval. Um, our first agenda item is actually a holdover. You'll remember we started this presentation at a previous meeting, but did not have enough time. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask Ms. Kraft and Dr. Wolf and Ms. Wicks from the English Language Arts Office to begin um, with a continuation of our presentation about our writing curriculum. This presentation you may remember resulted as a request uh, from some questions from board members, just understanding as a baseline overview, how do we approach the instruction of writing in BCPS? Um, so with that, I'm going to invite Ms. Kraft and Dr. Wolf and Ms. Wicks to take over. Um, and I'm hoping Mr. Corns has the slideshow available. If not, we can pull it up. Perfect. 
Thank you, Mr. Corns. So if we can go to slide 10, uh, because like Ms. Shea said, we did go ahead and start. So we've given you a little bit of a teaser. Um, so we're going to actually pick up on this slide right here uh, where we were going to talk about. Um, we were just going to take one standard for you and talk about um, uh, writing standard one, which is really to write arguments to support claims in an analysis of su substantive topics or text using valid reasoning and relevant or sufficient evidence. So we want to just show you how this looks throughout the grades. And so uh, you will see some bold uh, red to show how it shifts throughout the grades. So in kindergarten, they might write, but they also could draw or dictate. And at this point, we're just asking them to state an opinion or preference about the topic or book um, that they um, have chosen to write or dictate or draw about. Um, by the time they get to third grade, they're writing an opinion piece supporting a point of view with reasons. Then when they get to fifth grade, in addition to what they're doing in third grade, they now also have to include information. As they transition to middle school, you'll see that shift from opinion to arguments, and we start to talk about supporting claims with clear reasons and relevant evidence. And as we head into high school, uh, you will see that it refines even further to have an analysis of substantive topics using valid reasoning and sufficient evidence. And so that's how all of our writing standards will progress throughout the grades is that um, they will begin in kindergarten with the skills and then throughout the years, they will continue to refine those writing skills to be college and career ready. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to now turn this over to Dr. Wolf, who is going to talk about our elementary uh, writing beliefs. Good afternoon. So if you remember, I think it was last month that Ms. Kraft shared with you the beliefs, the writing beliefs we have for our office. Well, about seven years ago, our office, along with elementary teachers and reading specialists, developed a specific elementary writing belief statement to really ensure that explicit writing instruction with defined consistent expectations for all of our students is occurring at every grade level across the county. We really expect that all of our students grow as writers in their knowledge, motivation, and skills and move from that novice to skilled writer, just as you saw it in the scope of standards. This current document, along with some additional resources I'm going to share with you through the next few slides, are embedded in every grade level curriculum documents on Schoology at point of need and are used often um, every time we do professional learning with teachers and reading specialists around our writing. This is a continuation of our elementary writing beliefs, and this provides that teacher facing actionable um, teaching and learning measures. This is how we know what it should look like in the classrooms. These statements are actually linked to the standards and they frame our curriculum writing. They frame our professional learning and our instructional coaching of teachers at the classroom level while they're teaching writing and having students engaged in writing. This slide presents a visual graphic of the recommended classroom. Excuse structure. me, Dr. Wolf. Um, yes. Mr. Corns, I think we need to advance to the next oh, slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was advancing my own. There we go. Yes. I, I think we're back to slides, so this I'm is perfect. interrupting. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. No, thank you so much. So this slide is the continuation of the belief statement, which provides teachers that teacher facing actionable teaching and learning measures. And you can see these statements are actually linked to the standards and they frame our curriculum writing, professional learning, our instructional coaching, um, and they, 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 if you see the, the um, language in these goes from the different types of writing to the writing process, to using research, um, to connecting reading and writing, and then also really in those early grades is becoming fluent with handwriting, spelling, sentence construction, word processing. We want um, those skills to be well developed through frequent and often writing, daily writing. Next slide, please. This slide now presents a visual graphic of the recommended classroom structure for writing instruction. You'll see writer's workshop and the writing process. The writing workshop is a structured time that should be scheduled daily into all teachers um, 
daily schedules. And during this workshop time, the teacher supports the writer developing their piece of, of writing through different lesson components. The mini lesson is that whole class explicit direct instruction in a skill or strategy expected of all students. A mini lesson focuses on one aspect of writing. If you see in blue, some of the mini lessons that are um, written for teachers and are provided through each unit of instruction through our curriculum. Some are procedural, which teach about the classroom management system so the workshop functions smoothly, how to peer conference, expectations for self-evaluation, ways to publish drafts, um, and how to use like editing and revision checklists. Process is focusing on those specific strategies that support the development of a piece of writing. So taking students through the brainstorming, the planning, the drafting, editing, and publishing their piece. Author's craft focuses on teaching students how to analyze features and elements of a specific genre or type of writing. And we might focus on the voice, what writer's voice, word choice, sentence structure, developing characters during that author's craft mini lesson. And of course, writing skills, which are very important to be a successful writer. These are the conventions, parts of speech, sentence building, and paragraph structure. Students then need time for writing. We get better at writing when we have time to practice. And during that writing time, you'll see the process of writing is also emphasized and supported throughout that time for writing. Um, and then all writers need an audience for sharing their writing. So there should be opportunities for students to share their writing with their peers um, and have a chance to talk about what they're doing as writers to reflect and work together. Next slide, please. The next few documents I'm going to share with you are the specific elementary curriculum documents. So every grade level has a year at a glance, and this is a snapshot for elementary ELA. It allows teachers to see the big picture for each unit. It also is aligned. You'll see the standards are aligned in this document with and then the essential questions and big ideas are across the top. Going down on this, um, looking down the column of that first column in this document in the year at a glance, you'll see there are writing checkpoints. And checkpoints are smaller writing pieces. Sometimes these are on-demand writing, and sometimes it's taking students through the process of writing, the brainstorming, pub editing, revising, and publishing. Um, and these, these are going to be a series of analysis tasks, research tasks, or narrative tasks. Analysis tasks really help students to connect their reading and writing. It's a skill that um, actually research reveals is one of the most significant factors in differentiating a college ready student. This task asks students to carefully consider the text they've read and then engage with a prompt to answer a series of questions and compose a response to that prompt. It could be summarizing, it could be writing a character analysis. The um, and then research tasks are taking a topic and taking it through the research process, as well as narrative tasks are writing in, in that story with the, character, the narrative form. You'll also see on our year at a glance that there is a culminating event. A culminating event is the end of unit performance based assessment that's developed through many lessons throughout the unit. And I'm going to show you in the next couple of slides how that is designed and su teach supported for teachers to support their students. Um, the culminating event also has, um, it's actually next slide please, I'm getting ahead of myself. For the culminating event, when we plan our units, oh, can you go ahead? Thank you. When we plan our culminating unit, we really plan with that end in mind or the backwards design. So each culminating event or performance based event has a grasp document that the teacher can download right at point of planning to use to help her plan him or her plan with a clear expectation and a purpose for writing and how they're going to develop those different skills and processes through the unit. Um, this is an example, and this was in your handouts, I believe, of a fourth grade task um, from unit three. And in this unit, the student is a role of a blogger, the role of a book, they're going to write a blog, and they're asked to develop an opinion piece. So they're taking standard one, 
um, to take a stand on a social issue. And throughout this unit, students have been reading about different social issue, issues, such as environment, water bottles, um, it, uh, lots of different types of topics. Next slide, please. The second page of the grasp document, there is a rubric which aligns to the grade level standards and the rubric provides the specific success criteria and the accountability for each student's writing. The rubric is based from the MCAP rubric and the language in the rubric, the first part is actually specifically from MCAP. Then you'll see there is criteria in italics, which is task specific. And this measures the skills and strategies that are explicitly being taught it throughout the unit. Um, in this task, you'll see uh, that this is the rubric for the task of students being a blogger and a social issue. And you'll see that they have there's a reading connection where they are asked to add multiple pieces of evidence, evidence from at least two pieces of text to support their opinion, which is one of the fourth grade standards. Then the written expression portion of the rubric um, students are specifically asked to create a piece that is has a strong organization and it's structured in a log it's logically grouped. So the ideas are grouped together. The topic is introduced, the opinion is clearly stated, and then there's multiple reasons of evidence. The next part of the rubric, which isn't on the slide, is the conventions where students are asked to specifically, there's different forms of grammar and sentence clarity and um, combining sentence structure for this topic and which are linked to the fourth grade standards. Next slide, please. This is how the curriculum appears in Schoology, and this is a core learning plan um, where the teacher facing curriculum. So anything that is hype in blue is a hyperlink where the teacher can directly go to that lesson or that resource or document. So you'll see the first column is a suggested timeline um, and the second column is the scope and sequence for reading. And reading is outlined in our columns one, two, three, and four. So you'll see the suggested text for the anchor text and some small group suggestions. That fourth column is our writing column. So any mini lesson or any resources will be hyperlinked right there to support the checkpoints and the culminating event. And then the fifth column is the word work column. Um, in grades K through three, we're very happy to have open court right now, but in grades four and five, we're following the um, sequence of skills in wonders and those mini lessons are linked there as well. You'll also see in the fourth column for the writing, the writing overview, and that's where the belief statement is. That's where other documents are to support writing for teachers. Those are teacher facing materials. Next slide, please. If we were to go to if we were going to click into that writing column, this will take us. Thank you. This will take us into the specific mini lessons that build to that culminating event for grade four. So you'll see for each of the the criteria for that writing piece, there is a mini lesson that is aligned to that to help support the introducing a topic, providing resources. Then you'll see the practice um, using precise words and phrases as a fourth grade standard, coordinating conjunctions to combining longer sentences, and then also how to quote from the text. So there's many lessons within there and resources that may take more than one day that teachers will use for the direct instruction to specifically support that culminating event at the end of the unit. Next slide, please. So one of the things we hear a lot, we see is that writing is challenging um, and there's some challenges that we're seeing right now in our highly effective writing instruction for an elementary ELA. Why is writing so hard to teach? Can you click please, Jim? One of the reasons is um, we hear from teachers all the time that they don't always feel prepared to, to teach writing. Um, the pro there that, that we know that a lot of the undergraduate programs and even graduate programs, some of our reading specialists have not really had a lot of classes in teaching writing, whereas reading is a focus. Even in, CP, in our CPD courses for Maryland right now, we're currently rewriting those so they're focused on literacy, not just reading. So we're having some more opportunities for teachers to have that professional learning. Um, 
also one of the reasons teachers is so um, teaching writing is so hard to teach is many teachers don't view themselves as writers. Um, we're really usually good at teaching what we're good at doing. And uh, if you don't see yourself as a writer and necessarily practice it all the time, it's a little bit uncomfortable when you're going to teach and put yourself out there as a writer in front of your students. Um, and then also writing is a very form of a personal expression and there's it's very subjective. If you think about um, there's not a single correct response. There's not a single correct way to prepare to write or draft a piece of writing or polish it to draft. The only correct way to write is the method that works best for individual writers. Um, and this is think about how varied styles of published writers are. This makes it more challenging and why we have to continue to provide ongoing support and resources. Next slide, please. So here are some of the steps we've taken in the Office of Elementary English Language Arts to really support writing instruction. Um, in professional learning, we've spent a lot of time with our teacher leader core. We've spent two full years actually before COVID hit, spending time just on writing and unpacking writing and doing some standard setting on having teachers bring writing pieces together. We've done book studies. We've write, re, Writers Read Better by Colleen Cruz is a great one to connect how reading and writing are so intertwined. And also the Writing Strategies book by Jennifer Saravala. We've done that with reading specialists and we've also used those books with our third, fourth and fifth grade teachers. Um, and then in curriculum revisions, we've spent a lot of time developing those specific writing mini lessons aligned to the text and the culminating event and also that opportunity to really help teachers unpack and think about how does writing happen frequently and every day um, to use the process in on-demand writing. Next slide please. And this is Miss Swicks. Thank you, Ms. Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. So one of the biggest ways that we differ in secondary English, was there a slide before this that maybe we skipped? Maybe not. No, OK, thanks, sorry. Um, one of the biggest ways that we differ in secondary English from the elementary writing program is that at the middle and high school levels, our focus moves from the earlier mechanics of how to write to a greater focus on how to write well for specific audiences. The National Council of Teachers of English has a published position statement of their beliefs about the teaching of writing, and those beliefs guide our support of writing instruction. In secondary ELA, we maintain that everyone has the capacity to write, that writing can be taught, and that teachers can help students become better writers. Further, we maintain that people learn to write by writing, that it's a process and a tool for thinking. We believe writing grows out of many different purposes and occurs in different modalities and with different technologies. We believe that reading and writing are, in, are related, and we believe that the assessment of writing involves complex informed human judgment. Next slide, please. In support of our beliefs about writing, we maintain expectations for explicit writing instruction, and the way that often appears in our curriculum is shown on the screen. We use a blend of live and virtual modeling of the thinking and writing process within our lessons using both professional and student writing samples. We are also fortunate to have a, num a number of interactive digital lessons in our curriculum and in our electronic anthology to support students in the direct instruction on various modes or formats for writing. Next slide, please. Within the secondary curriculum, we set very clear expectations and multiple opportunities for the practice and application of writing skills. Every unit contains frequent shorter writing experiences to provide students with repeated exposure to skill development. We offer multiple opportunities for students to exercise their own choice in topic or format as part of our goal of being culturally responsive and encouraging student voice. We have partnered with other offices to develop longer process research and writing tasks, and every unit ends with a performance based assessment that allows students to demonstrate their mastery of the targeted writing standard. These multi phase writing assessments provide an authentic platform for expression and application of skills learned within the unit and students are given teacher feedback and the opportunity to revise before grading. This emphasizes our philosophy that writing is an ongoing process of feedback and revision. Next slide please. 
Here I'll offer just some illustrations of what I've shared. First, you can see we have a sample of a formative assessment within a lesson that offers students three different options for a response. They can choose to respond to a traditional, um, they can choose to respond in traditional paragraphs, or they can choose to respond by creating a visual representation with a written explanation, or they can choose to write a skit or an original scene from a play that demonstrates their understanding of the historical context of the text in question. Please click again. Next, we have a piece of a multi-phase research project in the form of what we call a slam dunk, <clears throat> excuse me, where students are led in an engaging and interactive inquiry that leads to a research-based writing response. Click again. <laughs> and we also have an example here of a writing task that leads to the unit ending PBA, performance-based assessment. You can see that students are led through the cycle of direct instruction, guided practice, and independent practice in preparation for the unit assessment. Next slide, please. Knowing that writing is a difficult area for many students, our secondary curriculum embeds support for striving writers at every grade level. Scaffolded resources are provided within lessons for all students that align to each step of the writing process. And as students progress in their skill levels, they are encouraged to remove our provided scaffolds and develop their own graphic organizers or outline templates, for example. Our digital anthology offers tutorials for additional support opportunities in conventions and revisions. And we have developed reflective activities to follow writing tasks to ensure that students have an opportunity for peer feedback, self-assessment, and goal setting based on identified strengths and weaknesses. This process creates a partnership between teachers and students, wherein students are able to take partial ownership of the learning process. Next slide, please. And here you can see some examples of what I mentioned in our digital anthology about our interactive level up tutorials. And so we have them on a variety of topics and what you can see on the screen are just a couple of stages where students would interactively work their way through multiple slides for this specific topic, for example, revising for unit coherence and organization. They are self paced and they are available for students to do as many times as necessary. Next slide, please. As I mentioned briefly earlier, part of our goal at the secondary level is for students to develop skills in writing for specific audiences and purposes. Our curriculum includes engaging and relevant formats for authentic publication. Students have the opportunity to create TED Talks, social media campaigns, scripts, speeches, among a variety of other products. One sample on the screen shows a middle school unit assessment where students are asked to research weather related disasters and emergency preparedness and then create a public service announcement as a result of their research to demonstrate their ability to integrate important information from multiple sources and to express that content clearly in an informative or explanatory format to educate others. The high school example is a unit assessment where students are asked to apply their literary analysis skills to a real world context. So the demands of this assessment are that after completing a novel, students are asked to demonstrate their understanding of the novel's purpose, structure, and point of view by creating a written outline for a novel-based television show. Both grade level assessments allow students to demonstrate their mastery of standards while providing them a real world application that is engaging and authentic. Next slide, please. Although our curriculum does provide resources for explicit instruction and opportunities for writing application, we know that we still, like elementary, face some challenges to highly effective writing instruction in secondary English classes. While we do have a percentage of teachers who feel that they lack experience or expertise in writing instruction, the large majority of our teachers report that the biggest barrier to effective writing instruction is large class sizes and large student loads. At the high school level, an English teacher can have up to 125 to 150 students or more at any given time. What teachers tell us is that this results in little or no time for reading and rereading multiple student drafts, little or no time for giving adequate and timely feedback, whether written or verbal. It often prevents the opportunity to give personal feedback, and so teachers often default to giving generalized overall class feedback that doesn't necessarily help each individual student. And they tell us that the realities of class sizes prevent them from creating opportunities for frequent revision and sharing of student writing. Next slide. 
As we've unpacked the implication of these challenges, we've spent a good deal of time considering where do we go from here. In secondary English as an elementary, our approach is twofold. We need to focus on professional development for teachers and we need to focus on curriculum revision. In the area of professional development, we plan to build teacher capacity for those teachers who share that they feel insecure in their ability to provide effective explicit instruction in writing and on how to give wholesale or individual feedback more efficiently. We plan to provide continued teacher training in reading apprenticeship because through reading apprenticeship, we can ensure that students are getting robust reading and writing opportunities in all content areas, not just English, thereby alleviating some of the perceived burden for English teachers. Teachers of all content areas can and should be exposing students to challenging texts and writing tasks, but we know we can't just expect that they know how to do it. Reading apprenticeship is the tool that teaches them how. We are also planning professional development opportunities for teachers to learn how to make better use of the digital tools that are available to them and to students for writing support and professional learning to develop teachers in their writing instruction in various learning environments, both in person and virtual, so that they can assist students in whatever format learning is expected to take place moving forward. On the curriculum revision end, if you could please click. Thank you. Um, on the curriculum revision end, our work is to streamline the content so that teachers with large class sizes can find ways to make time to engage repeatedly with their students in the full writing process. Our curriculum revision work will also include developing a more integrated approach so that lessons naturally incorporate explicit instruction within the context of, write, of literary analysis and lead to a written product in a more seamless fashion. Finally, we intend to make our expectations for the frequency and types of writing within the curriculum more explicit. Teachers have shown an interest in, refer in returning to a more formal system-wide expectation of writing portfolios or composition folders with clear guidance on what types of writing and how many of each piece at a minimum should be expected at each grade level. And that's something we can certainly work in collaboration with teachers to provide. A focus on professional development and curriculum revision will help us to meet teachers where they are and help them get where they need to be to support their students in their writing needs. Next slide. So really quickly to, to close out before we uh, take some questions, I really want to emphasize what we're working towards is a culture of writing where there's opportunities to use writing as a tool for learning, where there is explicit instruction, feedback that's helpful, not just critical. Um, and so that means that we have to give opportunities to write routinely over extended time frames and shorter time frames. There needs to be flexibility to allow opportunities for student voice and choice. There should be lessons that support the writing process, whether you're in second grade or 11th grade. And also, we want to leverage technology as a means to produce and publish writing independently, as well as an opportunity to collaborate with peers. So next slide, please. So now we will take any questions uh, around writing that you might have. Hey, I'm going to start um, with Mr. Offerman, but because he, he noted in the chat that he had a question we before we do that um it is 305 i know we have a lot on the agenda so miss shay i'm going to ask you um as we go through this portion questions and answers if you will go over the um agenda and just keep an eye on our time as well as any shifts that might need to be made so that we can do the things that are critical to yes, this meeting and then we can just change our future agenda. Yes, ma'am. And I can also offer to work with any members that have additional questions um, to follow up through Dr. McComas to make sure we get those answers as well. Excellent. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Offerman. First of all, thank you all for uh, for the uh, for an extremely good presentation. My question actually uh, or concern goes to not so much the development of, uh, of, 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 of having our students write uh, you know, better and more efficiently and, and you know, and, and, and that certainly is brilliant. Um, uh, one of my concerns is, uh, is about the actual, the actual act of writing. There are students in this era who basically, because we are so 
uh, focused on technology, right, but purely using the devices. But there are also some students who, you know, I, I think uh, might, you know, benefit by writing by actually using a pen or a pencil. And I'm wondering uh, how we address that in terms of student preference or in in terms of what's uh, what's actually best for students. Thank you. And I'll just I'll just sign off and you can talk. So um, thank you, Mr. Offerman, for that question. Um, we've had ongoing conversations and I'm going to approach this in two ways as quickly as possible. We do have ongoing questions, um, uh, conversations with primary teachers about handwriting um, as well as fine motor development across the board. So we know that there are a lot of um, studies currently out there about how has the age of technology and every child having an iPad by age two impacting their ability to develop those fine motor skills. We advocate at the primary and elementary grades that it has to be a balance. There must be explicit time now obviously the current context of the pandemic notwithstanding um, that classroom instruction has to include opportunities for students to um, develop handwriting both in print and cursive to have opportunities uh, to write in multiple formats we do gradually then um, to your exactly your point try to help our students understand that they need to identify um, the way that's best for them while not ever excluding an opportunity for both so we try to maintain that opportunity for balance both Ms. Wicks and Dr. Wolf mentioned uh, the difference between quick writes and publishing that's an opportunity where oftentimes students will use pen and paper for quick writes or those short pieces of writing responses to text and then when we move into the publishing phase that's where we often use um, technology but to your point there are some students who um, prefer um, so from an instructional standpoint we advocate explicit instruction in both a balance of both um, but then we also advocate supporting students in having that choice thank you Thank you, Ms. Shea. Dr. Hager. Hi, yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. And my line of questioning was very similar to John's. Um, and that is, you know, re with regards to the typing, I've seen my own children struggle with the pecking and, and, and what do they call it, pecking and uh, sorting pecking. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, as, as they type like this, trying to get their thoughts onto paper and it's painful to watch. And so I, I I really appreciate the the amount of thought that goes into the rubrics and the and the and the training and everything and then to, but to deliver it in a typing format, um, is there any collaboration with um, any sort of curriculum around typing so that kids can learn those skills so that their brains and their fingers can can go in sync so that we can actually you know get them to move forward at a younger age? Um, yes. So um, both, and we actually have standards that talk about students having to learn those skills. Um, they don't call it out as typing, but they talk about utilizing technology. Um, every third grade student has access to a license for a program called EduTyping, um, which is an opportunity for practice. We don't specifically have, um, as Dr. Wolf mentioned, um, a lot of expertise for teachers in teaching typing. So when, when I was in, in high school, I actually took a class where I had a, a teacher in middle school, I think even. Um, so that is something that I think we would have to develop in terms of guidance for teachers of how do you teach, because many of our teachers, especially our younger teachers, were themselves not taught typing. Um, so it's definitely an, an area that we need further consideration on um, around how to support our teachers in teaching students other than providing those practice opportunities through the edutyping resources I mentioned. Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with edutype. Um, yeah. And it's really, I mean, it's like a, an indoor recess tool essentially. <laughs> so it's not, it's not really taught. It's not teaching, right. Exactly, so yep. thank I mean, you. Exactly. Over finger placement, but doesn't talk about the actual teaching. Thank right, you. and, and given that we're expecting the students to, to, to type their essays, you know, it's, it just seems like a big lost opportunity. So, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Great feedback. Yes. I, I want to ditto that, Dr. Hager. I'm just amazed that we have no more keyboarding classes, and you're right. It, 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 it takes that time to have those fingers moving and that brain uh, moving and all of them in sync. Thank you, um, Ms. Shea. Um, Ms. Mack? Yes, um, thank you everyone for this. As you all were speaking, it, it sounded so familiar to me. I looked up a PowerPoint that I created for my students at CCBC called De Deconstructing Essays because I felt like based on their um, evaluative, I mean their remedial essay or their first essay, they needed some help. 
And a lot of the stuff that you talked about is in there, like the introductory paragraph, um, what is coherence versus what is unity? Um, what is a thesis statement? How does it guide your paper? But what I hear from teachers is that, and, and I'll go back to slide 19. Um, at the bottom, of, there was a list of things and towards the bottom were coordinating conjunctions. And I believe um, whoever covered that slide said, this is what we teach kids um, how to make more complex sentences. And this is actually something I taught at CCBC um, and referred to them as fanboys. And then right under that was quoting sources. And that's something that I also had to teach my students at CCBC. So my question is this. One of the statements was we might not be able to get to all this and we might have to pick it up. But teachers tell me often with a lot of the lesson plans that they get that there is not enough soak time. There is not enough time for kids to really grasp the skills, to practice the skills and to use them. And I, I know from teaching kids who are recent graduates from BCPS that yeah, I have to agree with what they're saying because I have had to go back and teach a lot of this stuff. So have we given any thought to slowing down the number of things that we teach and making sure that what we do teach children really learn? Like do we making sure that when we get to that lesson that has coordinating conjunctions and quoting sources that the teacher really does. And I think one of the slides actually had unity and coherence, but it seemed like an option. It seemed like if a child wanted to know more about unity and coherence, he or she could click on the slide and go there when I think it's a skill that should be taught. So I, I guess that's a whole lot of questions in one. So I'm, I'm going to try as quickly as possible. And as always, all of you ask wonderful questions and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, we know that time is a big factor and both Dr. Um, Wolf and Ms. Wicks referenced that, that it's an ongoing piece. How do we narrow the curriculum while still aligning to the standards because we still have those expectations of meeting the college and career, ready, career readiness standards as well as preparing our students for those high stakes assessments that we know can be gatekeepers. It's an ongoing conversation about how do we streamline and that takes two approaches. Um, it takes us constantly revising and streamlining curriculum so that it's not coverage and less truly is more and it also takes us and you heard us talk briefly today about concerted efforts for integration. It's work that really needs to happen because if writing is only happening in an 82 minute block in high school, that's never going to be enough time. Um, so we've been taking very explicit steps to try to integrate within content so students have multiple opportunities for this instruction throughout the day, as well as opportunities to practice. Um, so we, we agree it's an ongoing conversation that doesn't have a simple answer, but it's one that we're committed to continuing to work on and actually an, uh, a benefit to the pandemic. Um, if I can try to find silver linings any chance I can, we were forced to do that. We had to really prioritize and streamline our content, um, which I think was a really good opportunity and exercise for us to say, well, once we were forced to figure out what are the two most important you know, lessons in this week or in this unit, how can we then leverage that when we are given the gift of a full day schedule next year, but still recognize, well, when we had to choose, we knew what was most important. So that can be a support for helping us to streamline. Um, the second piece I wanted to say really quickly, the level up tutorials is not the only time students are taught. That unit is all around unity and coherence and organization, but then they have additional opportunities for ongoing practice that can be done either independently or in small groups. So that's a complement, not a supplement. I have one. Thank you very much. That makes me feel better. I have one more quick sure. question. When a teacher is observed, let's say a teacher in a science class or a teacher in a history class, is the observer observing for whether or not the teacher incorporates writing prompts and writing opportunities within that content? So we have worked um, to create, and uh, you may remember our literacy resource that we developed with LookForce for literacy, authentic literacy in every content area. So our hope is that those tools are utilized by department chairs and assistant principals and principals as a complement for those instructional walkthrough tools, because our purpose was to identify explicitly what are authentic opportunities for literacy for writing and science, for developing essays, even in our CTE classes. So that resource was developed three years ago. We did multiple professional learning um, and reading apprenticeship. As Ms. Wicks mentioned, that is also a focus that we are doing with every middle and high school. 
Thank you very much for the presentation and the answers. Thank My you. Pleasure. My turn. Yes, all right. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, that presentation, each of you, uh, for all of the information you gave. So I'm just going to sort of start backwards with what Ms. Shea said based on Ms. Mack's question, um, because it, it, it's not new. Um, we always looked at writing and with teachers, it was in your presentation that oftentimes the teacher doesn't see him or herself as a, as a writer. But we looked at every teacher as being a teacher of writing because as Ms. Shea just, um, to which Ms. Shea just alluded, it has to be ongoing and it has to be school-wide, system-wide in terms of uh, the skills, in terms of the look fors, et cetera. Um, are we still looking at that, Ms. Shea, in, in yes, that regard? Okay, yes, so then as we're creating a more professional development, then you'll be more, and you ladies will be more connected with making sure that all of the teachers across the areas are knowing how to give those students the opportunities for those narratives and the expositories, et cetera, et cetera. Is that correct? That is correct. And some okay. of the initiatives we've done, um, the next generation science standards integrate specifically the writing um, standards within the science context. And then I know this team helped approve the document based question or DBQ materials, which require mm -hmm. our social studies students to do short and extended mm -hmm. writing pieces through that analysis. So we're doing a much better job of being explicit and what that authentic literacy means, because as you know, years and years ago, when we would just declare that every teacher was a teacher of writing, some of our content experts in secondary didn't always feel that that was the case. And so we've been really doing a concerted effort to ensure that the professional learning, the curriculum resources, um, not only re reinforce that idea, but do so in a way that's authentic to the discipline. And be, and having that collaboration, is that happening um, uh, between content areas so that students, when they're doing their writings, they are putting on the brain that says, I see how this looks and what I want, how I want to answer this question um, coming out of a history um, context. And then here's one where I've read something in English and I'm looking at it from that context or whatever other areas they might be. So are, are we promoting those kinds of collaboration? And I know I will sound like a broken record and a sales pitch, but that's exactly what reading apprenticeship does and why we believe it is such a powerful force because it brings together collaborative teams from across the departments mm -hmm. in our secondary schools to develop those consistent expectations and strategies so that students are able to see that through line, but then also understand the nuanced differences that are apprenticing into that content. It's a okay. really powerful approach that does exactly what you've described. And I'm around this corner. The rubrics are great. When do the students first see the rubrics, however? That's critical. Mm -hmm. Our goal and the way in the curriculum is designed is that we link the unit overview. When you introduce the unit and tell the students what the design and the purpose of the unit is, that's when they should have an opportunity to see what that PBA or culminating event is. We want students from the beginning of the curriculum design to understand the goal of what they're working towards. So that rubric can be used throughout and should definitely be a part of the actual instruction of the assignment. They shouldn't be surprised um, about how their writing is being evaluated. All right, well, I have 4,500 more th questions, <laughs> but I'm an English teacher. So I'm going to stop here so you can um, go to uh, the right, next, next topic. Piece. Yes. We Thank appreciate you. the conversation. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Craft and Dr. Wolf and Ms. Wicks. Absolutely. I'm very proud Absolutely. of this team. They're and thank you, committee members, for um, such really on point questions. And again, thank you for the staff for this. This is a heavy load, heavy load. Thank you, so, Ms. Mr. Corns, next up is me. I'm bringing forward today for your approval. I now come several times a year um, on our phase form update. So you'll remember this is the process by which we come to you when we intend to offer new courses. So a part of our process is to let you know in advance new courses that we need developed 
um, so that we can get to the business of hiring curriculum writers and designing that um, prior to implementation. Next slide. So I've come several times this year. I brought you an update about the 2021 and then again last meeting around some summer courses in 21-22. Our goal is to always be a year ahead. So you can see that today I have some new courses that are actually for the 22-23 school year because our goal would be to have them in the registration guide come November, December for students um, to see in advance. And so there's three main areas of new courses for 22-23. Um, in our PTEC or Pathways in Technology Early College High School, you'll remember this is a program that was started several years ago, first at Dundalk High School and now is also at Owings Mills High School. As our first cohort of PTEC students matriculate up through the upper grades, we are seeking permission to create courses that would allow them to earn dual credit. Um, and so this is now getting into the higher levels of PTEC coursework, which is very exciting. In music, we're excited to offer a new offering in middle school, which is Guitar 8. Um, this would be available in both our comprehensive and magnet middle schools. We have many children who have expressed an interest, and so we're excited to design a course to allow them to take that um, as part of their fine arts credit. And then in our science um, area, we, we have been transitioning to the next generation science standards for a number of years. This course actually was brought several years ago and then um, has been in an extended pilot due to the conditions with the pandemic. Um, and we are now ready for the 22-23 school year to have it be offered system wide. And it's just that transition we've been making for several years. And then the last course reference there is for our STEM magnet um, programs in middle school school where we are um, we started before with a sixth grade course and so we will be offering that for um, sixth graders next year so this will allow us to have in place that next course for the magnet programs um, in several of our middle schools um, Deep Creek, Deer Park, Lock Raven um, and Sudbrook I believe um, to have that pathway. Next slide. And then getting really ahead in our vision, um, I am bringing forward today some additional courses that we are seeking to begin planning and begin designing and developing for the 23-24 school year. Um, it's always our goal to get into a place where we can be um, designing um, years in advance so that students have an opportunity to know what those offerings will be prior to registration. Um, two areas of dance. Um, one, the first one is um, called Fundamentally Adaptive Movement and Enrichment or FAME. Some of you may ref uh, recognize that reference. Um, the second is in our desire to really be culturally responsive and offer opportunities for our students to experience multiple ways of enjoying and performing. Um, we are excited to begin designing a Latin Dance One course. Um, and then in music, we are offering three new course um, descriptions. One is in music and society. This course is really, again, about different different ways that cultures experience music and how it reflects communities, as well as two different ensemble courses, um, percussion and then steel drum. So these are all the courses that we, um, hopefully you also got a phase form description that gives a little more detail in the interest of time, I just gave a high level. Um, but the next step would be if this were approved, then our teams go ahead and begin the design and development over the next year or two, and then we will come back um, with information once these are um, in practice as we do each year where we update the course registration guide. So with um, that, I'll take any questions. Ms. Shea, will these yes. courses count towards the fine arts or whatever mm -hmm. credit? and they'll be open so they it won't be just a narrow audience. Correct. Standing for a system. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Offerman. Yeah, I'm just wondering is 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 this uh is the is the physics offering simply a uh a, a, a an updated version of of of, uh, of what we're offering now? Correct. In fact, right. many of our schools are already using this in the pilot form. Um, right. This was several years now in the making where we've been revising all of our courses in middle and high school to, well, actually elementary through high school to align to the next generation science standards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. Dr. Hager is saying, um, Ms. Cox, can we make sure that they also receive the um, phase form summary? If you don't have it, I'll make sure to follow up so that they can have that information. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hager, for letting me know that. I'll follow up. Yeah, the, so, the attachment is just these slides. It's not OK, I can make sure I'll follow up on that. Thank you. So Ms. Shea, what you want from us is the go ahead. Is that correct? Yes, the approval allows us to begin designing these courses and then writing the curriculum and professional learning to support them so that they can okay. ultimately go in the course registration guide. OK, all right. So 
I would like to have a motion to um, for approval of these courses for exploration. Is that a good word, Michelle? Do you have another word? You yes, development, that? curriculum development. Development, curriculum development. Much better. Okay. I need so a motion. Moved back. Thank Look you. Thank Look you, Mr. Offerman. Um, Ms. Cox, can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Um, Ms. Pastor? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Moving um, right along, our next item, if that's okay, Ms. Pastor. I'll yes, 326, you. continue on. Okay, our next item is another item for approval. As you know, we have actually two that we've combined. The first one is our novel proposals. You'll remember we've come to you actually several times this year as part of our ELA office's efforts to ensure a more culturally responsive curriculum. They have been engaged in an audit and we have been identifying new novels and resources to put into our um, secondary curriculum. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Kraft and Ms. Wicks to share the process um, aligned to 6002 that was used to include a variety of stakeholders to choose, and then they can talk about the new novels that we're really excited to bring forward tonight. So Ms. Kraft? So we are so excited to bring to you some new novels um, to uh, add to our curriculum. Um, and so Ms. Wicks is going to give an overview, a quick overview um, of the novels in our process. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Kraft. Um, as Ms. Shea said, this is really a continuation of or in addition to the novel presentation I shared in March. So I will go pretty quickly since I was told I have six minutes. All right, <laughs> next slide. <laughs> We talked last time about our BCPS student demographics and my office's commitment to providing literary materials that better reflect the diversity of our student body. Next slide. And while last time we spoke specifically about racial and ethnic demographics, our office is also very intentionally focusing on inclusivity for our LGBTQ student population. A national survey conducted by the CDC reports that about 1.3 million high school students identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. Additionally, the 2019 Maryland State Snapshot conducted by GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, reports high numbers of LGBTQ LGBTQ students experiencing harassment, bullying, and violence in schools. And their organization makes the specific recommendation that school-based supports such as LGBTQ inclusive curricular resources will result in more positive school experiences, including lower victimization, lower absenteeism, and higher academic achievement. Next slide, please. So hopefully you will see that the titles I present today are in line with the specific representation goals previously highlighted in BCPS Rule 6002. Next slide, please. And with the goals in our BCPS Compass that we also discussed in our earlier presentation in March. Next slide, please. With that, I bring forth five titles for your approval consideration. These titles were on public display as required from May 5th through May 19th. Next slide, please. So our first text is New Kid. It's a graphic novel for students in grade six reading that explores issues of race, class, and friendship when a student moves and enrolls in a new private school where he is the racial minority. It is written by award-winning author Jerry Kraft and will capture reluctant readers with its funny and heartwarming presentation. Next slide, please. We Rise, We Resist, We Raise Our Voices is a creative collection of essays, letters, poems, and artwork intended for grades six through eight. This text includes works created by authors and illustrators from a wide range of cultural backgrounds and explores multiple topics created to identity, connected to identity. Next slide, please. Moving to our offerings for high school, we have Darius the Great is Not Okay. This is a work of realistic fiction that highlights an Iranian-American main character, a perspective largely absent from our curriculum, who is working through issues of mental health, immigration, identity, and cross-racial friendships. Through his travels to Iran and back to America, Darius go undergoes a journey of self-awareness and growing self-confidence that will resonate with adolescents of all backgrounds. Next slide, please. 
Next up is Aristotle and Dante Uncover the Secrets of the Universe. This award-winning book explores the story of two Latinx teens from very different backgrounds who develop a relationship that helps each of them to understand themselves, their identity in the LGBTQ community, and in the world around them. Acclaimed for its lyrical writing, it provides many opportunities for literary and structural, structural analysis, as well as a perspective not previously featured in our high school novel options. Next slide. Finally, we offer the highly praised memoir by ta Coates, Between the World and Me. Written in the form of a letter to his adolescent son, this book explores through a combination of personal narrative and historical analysis, the idea of what does it mean to grow and to thrive as a young man of color in the United States. Next slide, please. All right, I made it under time and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. <laughs> Excellent job, Miss Wicks. <laughs> Miss Mac, thank you, Miss Wicks. Woo -hoo! <laughs> thank you. Um, I have three very quick questions, and I'll just re ask the questions, and then you can just answer them all together. Are these physical books? Are any of these decodables? And are there are any of these specifically incorporated in our curriculum, or are these books that students get up and read when they want something to read? Great question. So Ms. Wicks, you want to answer those? I'm happy to, thank you. So the first question, yes, these are physical books. So um, students will have a physical copy, um, budget pending always. Um, the second question I missed, so I'm gonna skip to the third and I'll come back to ask you to repeat the second. Um, they, pending approval, what will happen on our end is that we will have, uh, much like the courses Ms. Um, Shea was talking about, we will have curriculum writers develop resources around them so that they would be embedded into the curriculum, but only after we've developed not only the materials for teachers and students to use, but also the very specific professional development that would be needed for teachers to implement those resources effectively. Um, anytime we try to put new works in, particularly any that have any um, new racial sensitivity or any, um, any kind of sensitivity, our goal is to make sure we're embedding the PD in the curriculum and also providing those opportunities as individual professional learnings so that we understand and teachers understand how those books really should be implemented. And what was your second question? Question two was, that? are these decodable? And the answer or, is no. These, these are not decodables. They are written at um, an alignment with the text complexity of the level they support. So they're written at approximately a sixth grade decoding for the middle school books and then the ninth grade. Um, so if you were, um, when we talk about the term decodable, we typically talk about protected text that can, that all of the words in there are predictable from decoding or controlled for decodable purposes. Um, so I don't know if that's exactly. No, I guess what I'm getting at is we, we I think it's system 144 and reading 180. We approved um, those for remediation for our middle and high schoolers. So we do have some gaps and I find these topics fascinating and I believe that students would too, but if they do not have the skills to read, how are we going to impart the information that these books have? And would we consider providing some form of this book for our struggling readers? OK, so now I understand your question a little better. So Ms. Wicks, I'm going to take a crack at it. Remember when we talked to you, and, and I appreciate you always make the, the connections. So within System 44 and Read 180, there are supplemental books that are at a decodable level that are culturally responsive. So that is for students to practice the skills that they're learning as they're being taught those explicit skills. These novels would be, and those students are enrolled in that intervention during a reading course. All students are also enrolled in an ELA course where they're working on standards at the grade level. These novels will be written into the grade level ELA course, not the reading course. So students would have both. What we will do though, as Ms. Wicks described with the um, development of curriculum, we will develop resources for striving readers to access complex text. And sometimes that includes a combination of using um, text anchors, read aloud, um, opportunities for students to engage in chunking or portions of it. So we do both. Students will have an opportunity, so all students in their ELA class will have these texts, knowing that we have to build into the curriculum those scaffolds to support our striving readers as well. That's exactly where I was going. Thank you very much. You got it, sure. And before Dr. Hager comes in, I just want to throw in that four of them, I don't know, new kid, um, but 
Ms. Shea, you just, and I'm glad Ms. Um, Mac asked the question because sometimes we have to give those things that are not those pieces of literature that are not just about the building because we build in different ways. And so they are excellent for um, if you're going to use chunking and scaffolding mm -hmm. and just in the the, um, the the conversation. The other thing, um, they are wonderful pieces and I'm, I'm just assuming that new kid will fall right in line and does fall in line with the others, but they are they, I, I'm just happy, thank you. I'm happy to see them um, being put before us. And also just the, um, the notion of the PD for the teachers. That's always what worries me mm -hmm. is that professional development, that these, these pieces are not just done on a surface level, that students get an opportunity to delve deeply into it. And I really will be interested in seeing the PD because it's going, there will be some courageous conversations <laughs> just getting yeah. teachers prepared to work uh, and facing themselves to be able to work with these pieces with students if we're going to get what we want out of them. But thank you. The, mm, yes. And I have no doubt that new kid is 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 just as wonderful as the rest. And Ms. Pesher, we're happy to invite you when we have the professional. Please. Absolutely. Please. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was going there. To have you. Please, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. See, Hager, I was invited you to the how. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Hager. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to thank you for pointing out the need to um, include uh, books that are specific to LGBTQ students, and I think that that's a, a great recommendation and something that um, I'm really proud that our, our county is focusing on. But I think it was there only one of the five books that really had um, had a theme of uh, LGBTQ kids in it. I just um, so it's really two technically. Aristotle and Dante has the more overt theme of the LGBTQ community, but Darius the Great also has some um, peripheral characters that are in the LGBT community as well. Okay, and I assume this isn't the end, right? Like, oh, this, correct. Oh, no, no. <laughs> this is the beginning. Oh, no, we're going to be coming lots and lots. Back. <laughs> you're going okay. to get tired of us. Yeah. <laughs> and I would just throw out there, if anybody's looked at the money that I've been sending out, I know Dr. Hager, the people on the committee have seen it. We have from all source, different sources, we have money coming at us and we need, Ms. Mack said it the other day, we need it for PD, we need it for materials and resources to grow our students and yes. give them opportunities. So. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Okay. We spend it, we promise. Oh, and, 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 and we want it to be well spent. Um, thank you so much. Ms. Pester, right. we do need an approval for this one. So yes, if you can help do. us with that. I know, I'm so excited. Oh, Let me call you. my mountain top. Okay. <laughs> So moved, Mac. Just bring it back. Thank you, Ms. Mac. Can I have a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, Ms. Cox, will you give me a um, roll call vote, please? Yes. Um, Ms. Pastor? Yes. Ms. Mac? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right, Ms. Shea. All right, Thank we're going to move right into our next approval item. Um, as we shift gears, it's still Ms. Kraft is going to be with us, and I don't know if Ms. Uh, Wicks or Dr. Wolf are going to join. Um, oh, you know what? Did we skip the um, Mr. Corns? There should be one for um, intervention tier two and tier three materials. Ms. Cox, do you know if he has that one? Um, if not, I can actually bring it up, maybe. Ms. Shea, the, um, the PowerPoint deck that I have uh, is a combined yeah, uh, group. So um, the slides I'm seeing go from this to this to this. Would it be OK for me to take over the screen and share it? Uh, absolutely. Sorry, Thank you, Ms. Shea. I don't know if I have that one. OK. I will switch gears. I think because they were grouped together in the agenda, it might have been confusing, Ms. Cox. Um, but no problem. Don't judge how many tabs I have open. And we will get Never. into it. 
<laughs> so go ahead, All Ms. Right. Kraft. So ne yeah, next slide. I'm going to be super quick in the interest of time. Um, and so just really quickly, I'm not going to, I know we've already showed you our vision and mission before, but the idea is that we do want accomplished readers and writers, that we want to make sure that we are being culturally responsive and that there is equitable access. And so we're bringing three new programs today in the um, pursuit of our mission and vision. Next slide. Um, and so I know that we've gone over Scarsboro Rope, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I did just want to talk, talk about, we are going to be talking about the decoding strands. So when we think about our phonics and phonemic awareness, what you'll see me presenting today is that section of the rope. Next slide, please. Um, and so when we think about a multi-tiered system of support, um, Ideally, 80 to 85 percent of our students would be um, successful with the core. Around 15 to 20 percent would need tier two, and between one and five percent would need tier three. Um, and we are trying to um, change that because that's not our exact ratio in Baltimore County, but we are trying to change it by putting these programs in place. And so the next few slides will talk about which programs we're going, we would like to add to our menu of options. So the first one, um, and this is all out of our RFI, um, the review team is recommending moving forward with HD Word, which is by really great reading. Um, and we are recommending this for high school use for students that are in need of a tier two phonics based intervention. It's a very fast paced intervention for students that are struggling with multisyllabic words. Um, they do have um, already some basic proficiency in phonics, but need some more decoding strategies, particularly around the more advanced phonics skills. And so the, the really nice thing about this is because it's so quick paced, um, it doesn't always have to be scheduled as a full class. So if a student has resource room or another level of support, it would fit into that. And so this gives students some options. So that's that's our first recommendation. Next slide. Um, the second one is Lexia Language Live. We are also recommending this for our high school um, for students in need of a tier two comprehension based and phonics based intervention. So this actually attacks both of the strands. Um, and this would actually work on um, a strategic systematic approach to phonics instruction while also trying to get students to comprehend text. And so it's multifaceted um, and we would like to put that in at the high school level. Next slide. And the last one we're bringing forward um, today is Wilson Reading System, um, which I know you all know we already have. You've seen it on our triangle that we've shown you, um, but we actually need to put an official contract in place. It is being successful. We would like to continue to expand the offerings of Wilson. And so this would actually be proposed for elementary, middle and high school students needing tier three phonics based intervention. Um, and so these are for students who required more intensive structured literacy instruction, either due to a language based learning disability such as dyslexia, or they just have missed a lot of skills and we need to shore those up. Um, so those are the three that uh, we're proposing to move forward as part of our menu of yeah. intervention options. And um, if I can, thank you, Ms. Crafton, for going so quickly. Um, I, I do want to contextualize a little bit. Sometimes we come to the committee, um, like in the instance of Open Court and Bridges, and we're seeking approval for a resource that we are also then rolling out and purchasing system wide. Um, in other cases, we are coming forward with resources that are approved that then can be on a menu that schools then can decide based on an SST process um, to, to have at their access that we can provide as a support to schools along a menu. So yeah. that's where these resources, we are not at this time in a position to do a system-wide purchase for every class or every school, but instead when we go through the process of 6002 to even identify materials, materials in order for any school to be able to use Wilson Reading or to have other options if one of those resources has not yet been successful. Part of our responsibility is to go through that process and bring them forward for approval. So I just wanted to make that distinction because we are not here saying we're going to be purchasing this system wide, but rather adding them to our list of possible resources to provide. Thank you for that clarification, Ms. Shea. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Kraft. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Ms. Mack? Um, yes, I, I don't know if anybody's had time to see it, but I sent an email last night outlining some concerns and some items that I would like to see included in any request for um, any type of materials. And they include questions like where was the product or offering piloted? What were the outcomes? Who is the audience? Which you've answered that question today very clearly. What is the cost per student? And who is intended to deliver the product or the offering? And I know in tier, is it tier one? Tier three is the reading specialist and or the special educator. Um, and my specific question, reason for asking that question is, I don't think we should continue to push products out if we haven't taken the time to provide the professional development for teachers to provide the support to students who may use those. So um, the next question is, when would the system start using the product with fidelity, meaning that every student for whom the product is intended has a teacher or more than one teacher who is trained in delivering that product um, so that the student gets the benefit? And then when could we as a system expect to see the benefits of using these products? And I, I don't know if you can even answer that quickly, but for me, the fact that we have so many good products out there and so many of our teachers aren't trained, I think we need to include our training plan when we suggest products because it doesn't make sense to keep putting them out there if the teachers don't have the time to be trained to be the best teacher of that product that he or she can be. And before you answer that, I want to just um, piggyback. I'm glad I did see um, that, Ms. Mack, your email. Um, and I concur about the PD, but what goes with that is we do the PD, um, give everyone a thumbs up, send them back to their schools. I want to know as well, and I would as well like to know how, and that's a bigger thing than what we can do right here, right. how we know that the person who came out for the training heard what you oh. were really saying, yeah. and then they went back into the school and they were able to present to the appropriate staff, if not all of the faculty, um, what you intended then to see how it was implemented and what the results were. And I know that that goes beyond you. That is a whole systemic issue. And I think we need to embrace that. And I need all of you to be able to articulate that cabinet. So every time we get these kinds of pro uh, products, I'm going to just say that we are taking it through each one of those steps and not make the assumption that whoever did the PD is golden and they made gold happen in the schools because it's clear that is not happening. Well, that's actually what I meant with fidelity, but you explained it much better. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Well, and, and I want to um, thank both of you and, and Ms. Mack. We did receive, of course, Dr. McComas is out celebrating her daughter today, but of course I'll follow up with her so that we can um, get you the detailed response. I did also um, reach out with Ms. Kraft and, and Dr. Wolf to talk a little bit more about that too. So we will be getting back to you. Um, we wholeheartedly agree that professional learning for any program is critically important. Part of what you'll see in the next presentation when we talk about the high quality math materials is that um, we approach, and that's why I made the distinction about this particular context. Um, so when we're doing a system-wide adoption like open court bridges or some of the secondary materials that you're about to see, yes, we're required when we go to cabinet to come with a professional learning plan and a communication and we also develop resources for um, in partnership with the Division of School Support and Achievement for what are those follow-up uh, look-fors the way you described Ms. Pestor for fidelity of implementation and in fact this summer um, as we're planning Leadership Academy, the focus is on supporting administrators with fidelity of implementation of bridges because we've made a significant investment in open court and bridges. Now we have to have that transfer of application. So we can talk more about that because it is a really important topic. The one distinction I want to make here today, the inception or that really the driving force behind even going out to RFI was really to be able to continue our offering of Wilson. Wilson has been in place for a number of years and some of our um, in tier three situations with many of our special educators um, is supporting some of our students who need the most intensive intervention. 
in order to align with our procurement procedures, we have to go through this 6002 process to make sure that we're securing the appropriate approval outlined with policy and rule to be able to continue to do that for new students and students in our school for whom this is being successful. And so that might involve if Wilson comes out with a new version. If we didn't go through this process to be able to move forward with a contract, we wouldn't even be able to purchase that next version. When the team went through the process of RFI, in, besides Wilson responding, we actually found two other really highly rated materials. So at this moment, we are not yet at the point of piloting or purchasing it system wide, but in order to even have the approval to keep going with Wilson, we had to go through that RFI 6002 process. Um, so I, I just wanna make that distinction because if we were here today saying, we're now gonna be doing, um, Lexia language in all of our high schools, we would be coming to you with pilot data and a professional learning plan because we agree that's critically important. Um, but that is not what this is for. This is really us saying um, before we can even do that, we need to go through the process of identifying those resources in alignment with our policy and rule. Can I just make one comment about that? I want to request in front of you know the whole team that maybe a top a future topic is how our purchases align with our oh, professional okay. development and all of that. Yes. And then I guess my other question is I did some investigation with Wilson and it looks like it takes 90 hours mm -hmm. to be able to implement with fidelity. Uh, uh, feedback I got this week is a lot of principals would not force the issue of Orton Gillingham because I believe it takes eight days. Ten. I think yes. we need to look at the practicality, if you will, of our offerings, given that teachers have such limited time outside of the classroom to to be the best teachers that they can be. I, I think we just need to look at, at it differently. So I appreciate that and I agree that it can be a full topic on its own. I think that would be a wonderful opportunity. What I will say is that we're also, um, Wilson It is a very strict um, expectation for training because of the nature of, of who we're serving with this program. This, these are our students that need the most intensive support, oftentimes um, in the furthest point of their school career. So this sure. is, is critically important. Um, it's also why we have a both and approach. Letters is much more doable. It's still significant, but a lot easier from a, a fiscal perspective. So we have a both and approach. What do we need to do for every teacher? And then there are some instances where we need a very specialized program, which comes with it very specialized training. But what you surface with Orton Gillingham is a real fiscal impact and a staffing impact. So it's part of why our approach to Orton Gillingham has not been anyone who wants it can sign up, which I know there's tons of teachers that would love that professional opportunity and I would love to give it to them, but I can't justify pulling out teachers for 10 days of instruction from their classroom unless I can align it with you have a student you're serving in your building and you're going to be the practitioner that's teaching them. Instead, what we try to do is take some of the strategies from Orton Gillingham to build in and that's where letters comes in and that's where our reading specialist comes in. Um, so we're constantly trying to balance what's the specialized training and specialized program for those most intensive students, but then also what's the universal support and training for all of our teachers of reading. I'll reserve my comment because I do have a comment to that when we talk about this because of time. Um, sure. You know, because we have a lot of kids who are not on grade level and I would argue that a lot of our students would benefit from the most strategic um, systems of support, what regardless of cost and and I can't believe I actually just said that out loud. Um, <laughs> and I will remind you of that. I'm here for it. If it's a good product and it's going to help our kids get where they need to be, then we need to have a strategy to make sure that all kids have what they need. So I'll reserve that. Okay. Moving right along, Ms. Pestier. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fisher, I need to ask Dr. Wistad because I know we have several other items that are coming forward for contracts and I know that we're short on time. Um, right. Dr. Wistad, we have math and we have the COGAT. Are all of them on the June 8th board meeting? Yes, and I also have the instructional materials, which is the items that they buy in the preschool and the pre-K and kindergarten classrooms. They're all for June 8th. So, Ms. Pester, I need your guidance. All of the items left are going to the board. I know that this committee, we typically um, preview those materials, even though they will be fully vetted in the contracts committee as well. So, um, 
given that we only have a few minutes before the equity committee, what would be the best plan? Mac, are you on contracts? I am not. Mr. Offerman, are you on contracts? Mr. Offerman? Yes. yes. You are. Okay. Um, all right, can can we I, I can ask, I can text Ms. Scott and ask her if she can give us five extra minutes so that okay. um, Dr. Wisted can get started with this so that we can at least get a sense of moving it forward. And if you are going to come to contracts with a deeper dive, would that work for the rest of the committee? Just give me a thumbs up. Yay. Yeah. Ms. Mack. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Yep, definitely. Thank you. All right. Go Ms. Ahead. Fester, in addition to Dr. Wisted's items, we do also have our math, our secondary math um, series has been selected by the committee and is also going on June 8th. So um, Dr. Wisted, why don't you go first with perhaps the two well, that you need and then we'll figure this out. This is Gypsy. Did we need to vote on the um, phonics oh, tier one, tier two, yeah, and tier yeah. three? Yeah. yeah. We so do. We'll move back. Thank you. OK, go Dr. Wisted, go, go. OK, Jim, do you want to put up the instructional materials one first? I think that one's going to be easy. Um, and maybe we won't even go through all of the slides, but basically this is a contract modification. So JMI 625.17 is already in existence and it is, um, oh, that's the math one. That's Megan's. Um, this one's called instructional materials. Anyway, the uh, materials that are typically purchased under this contract are for our preschool and our pre-K classrooms. You can go to the next slide. Um, there are things like um, puzzles and uh, educational type materials that are used in our preschool and our pre-K classrooms. We also use those um, materials in our Eliza Brandwine Center, ABC Center, and our um, Judy Center that's at Campfield and Hawthorne. And um, so the Office of Special Education, as well as the Office of Early Childhood Programs, you can go to the next slide, spend on this, and all of the, the vendors um, are will be listed on the contract so you can see where they come from. Also know that in addition to what, when we open new classrooms like preschool or pre-K classrooms where we need to buy materials from this vendor, we could go to the next slide. There are also um, school-based purchases that are made. So anytime that uh, perhaps a principal would be interested in replenishing materials in their preschool or their pre-kindergarten classroom, they may also spend on this contract. So. That's the basic gist of that one in just a few minutes. Questions? We can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, then our, do you want to vote on this one? And Ms. Pester, when we vote, I think Ms. Mack made a motion to vote on the tier interventions, but I don't think we actually did the roll call vote, so perhaps we could do both. Yes, okay. Um, okay. please, um, Ms. Cox. Okay, so for the tier, I need a second for the tier two and tier three. Second, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Okay, um, Ms. Pastor. Yes. Ms. Mack. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Okay, then we'll go to the next one for um, instructional material. A motion. So moved, Mack. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Second, okay. Offerman. Um, Ms. Pastor. Yes. Ms. Mack. Yes. Mr. Offerman. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And did we do the instructional materials one? We did both of them. Yes, we just yeah. did. Okay. <laughs> Should okay, I go so back to our... math? I, I don't think we have time for math. I guess move forward to the COGAT. And we'll have to talk with Ms. Dr. McComas about math. Um, well, we're still at four o'clock. OK, let's see if we could do the Reader's Digest first. And I have Mr. Wade Kearns with me. Um, and so some of you I know were at the GTCAC 
meetings. So you already kind of have some background on this that we are required by the Maryland State Department of Education to administer a group administered abilities assessment. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And I'll just start out on this part. These were the MSDE approved assessments for us to choose from. We went through the whole um, process as far as uh, uh, we put out for bid and those things were uh, evaluated. So Wade, do you want to jump in at this point? Sure, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, we uh, sent out an RFI. We heard back from three of the four uh, test publishing companies in response to that RFI. Um, and then uh, we put together an evaluation committee that included a variety of stakeholders. We had school-based folks, uh, teachers and principals. Uh, we had uh, uh, CNI folks and we had um, representation uh, for parents uh, from the GTCAC. Uh, and so an evaluation tool was developed. Um, it was uh, basically four different categories and a rating was given, a numerical rating was given in each one of those categories for each of the various assessments um, that were sent back, the COGAT, the Naglieri, and the Terranova InView. Um, uh, of the three, the COGAT uh, scored the highest. Um, Although I should mention that uh, there was only about a 30 point difference between the COGAT and the Naglieri out of uh, over 700 points total. So those two were relatively close, uh, but still the COGAT was the, um, had the uh, highest rating of the three. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, just a little information about the COGAT itself. Uh, it's a cognitive abilities test is what COGAT stands for. It comprises of three subtests, a verbal, a quantitative reasoning, and a nonverbal subtest. Uh, it's used by about 75% of the school districts in Maryland. In fact, MSDE has negotiated a, a contract price with Riverside Insight because so many of the districts uh, within Maryland use uh, this particular assessment. Um, and Baltimore County also has some experience working with Riverside Insight and the COGAT. At. We uh, piloted uh, just the nonverbal subtest of the COGAT several years ago. Uh, so we have some experience working with the company and we're familiar with the assessment itself. Um, so that's sort of the very quick version. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer them if I can. Okay, hearing none, this is also an approval item because it will be going forward to the contracts. And thank you, uh, Mr. Kearns. Uh, Ms. Cox, roll call, please. We have to have the motion, Ms. Uh, Jones. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, can uh, someone move, please? So moved, Mac. Thank you. Uh, A second. Second, Alderman. Okay, Ms. Cox. Uh, Ms. Pastor? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you, Megan. I think you could squeeze. You got two minutes to get that in. Go, I think they have to go to equity. Um, I, I so told Miss Scott we'd be there at 4.06. So it is 4.04. We have two minutes. Um, Mr. Corns, can you go back to the math? I, what I will, I'm hoping, Ms. Pastor, is maybe we can leverage some of the ideas about different ways of looking at professional learning to also think about ways I could provide a recorded PowerPoint um, to follow up on this. Um, Mr. Corns, okay. if you can move forward. Um, what I wanted to bring to your attention is that we are moving forward with the recommendations from the JHU audit. You know we spent a significant amount of time and attention with the elementary curriculum and bridges. We have two contracts that will be coming forward. Um, one is about approving. We have identified a series. We're very excited. We went through the whole 6002 process to identify a series. Um, and our, the exciting part is that we, while we do not have funding and are not moving forward at this time with a purchase for grade six through Algebra two, um, we have identified a cohesive series, which is new for BCPS and very exciting. If you can click through, um, you can click several, keep going, I'm reminding you of the audit recommendations that we overhaul the curriculum and identify, keep going, high quality instructional materials, keep going. And so keep going. This is all just referring, um, we did follow everything outlined in 6002 and the recommended program we want to move forward with over the next three to four years, we will be continuing to come back with recommendations to purchase uh, the Kendall Hunt Illustrative Mathematics. And so um, 
this is a high quality instructional material. If you click to the next slide, it has been reviewed by Ed Reports. You can see the external evaluation is all green for all of the courses sixth through high school. It exceeds expectations in terms of a high quality instructional material. At this time, our primary goal for uh, moving forward, next slide, we wanted to identify the series in advance so that we had a coherent series expectations for sixth through high school. You can click the next slide. Um, when we move forward, keep going with the contract at the upcoming contracts committee, you will see that the contract term is for many, many years. We do not at this point keep clicking, please, Mr. Corns. Um, keep going. This is just more information about illustrative math and why we are working towards it. It is a very different approach to teaching math, but as I referenced, is considered a high quality instructional material in its alignment to the college and career readiness standards. If you can click forward, keep going. Um, keep going. It shows all the different teacher materials. I know we often get asked and as Ms. Mack, I want to make sure I show. Keep going. These are all the materials teachers get. It is a blended program. We will have real books. We will also have digital access. So um, that is often a big question. Um, for the next school year, the contract that will be coming forward, the primary expenditure will be for our high school geometry classes, um, as well as a system wide pilot for both geometry and advanced five. We were not able to pilot this year because of the pandemic. Um, so moving forward next year will be the year that we are piloting. We are also going to spend the entire year in training and piloting for Algebra 1. Um, so if you can click forward. One more. This is a snapshot of all of the different levels. Oh, back, I'm sorry, one quick, I have 30 seconds. Uh, a snapshot of the professional learning. The other contract, so the contract that will be coming forward will be a multi-year contract because over the next three years, our goal is in alignment with that audit recommendation to overhaul the math curriculum, starting next year with the pilots in Geometry Advanced 5 and the training for Algebra 1. Next and last but not least, we also have a contract. Our AP statistics and calculus contracts are expiring. So we did come together with a group aligned with 6002 to identify the replacement text. And you can see here the two contracts that will be coming forward will be to replace the materials for physical books for AP calculus and statistics at the high school level. Next slide. <laughs> Keep going. It's uh, print and digital. This is our professional learning materials throughout June and August and professional study day. We'll be providing training. It's a very small number of teachers um, that teaches AP calculus and statistics, um, but again, their contracts have expired and so it became necessary to replace them. Uh, we are also creating a professional learning community of these teachers and they will have dedicated unit planning sessions as well as monthly meetings to support the new materials. And I think next is the last one. That's it. 408, please apologize to Ms. Scott. Ms. Yes. Um, Mac, I see that you have a question, but I'm, I'm, very, gonna, I'm very quick. Wait a minute. Hold, hold, wait a minute, because we are beyond even the six. So mm -hmm. I'm going to ask since um, is there do we need to do a roll call, Ms. Shea? All right, let's do that first, Ms. Uh, can I have a motion uh, so, on these items, please? So moved, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Os Offerman. Can I have a second? I'll second it, but I have a question. All right, thank you, Ms. Mack. OK, Ms. Cox, will you do a roll call, please? Ms. Pastor? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Rothman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank you. Now, while Ms. Mack is asking her question, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mr. Offerman. He can bring us home. And uh, there's nothing else on which because he's not on equity. Um, and Ms. Mack can direct her questions to the rest. And then Dr. Hager and I can go to equity so we don't hold that one up anymore. Ms. I Pastor, appreciate you so much. Thank you so much. Thank Ms. you. Pastor, I don't mean to interrupt the meeting, yes. but until I can leave this meeting, oh, uh, that's equity right. can't you start. Still have this <laughs> I, I just have All really right, go ahead. Talk over me, Ms. Mack. Go ahead. Hurry up. I'm so just concerned that we're signing a multi year contract on something that we're trialing. How do we know the outcome of the trial that at the end of that we are going to even want to purchase it on a multi year? That's my question. So you want me to answer that right now? So there's yes, a couple of things. You can maybe answer it in, in writing if you want, but that is okay, my right. question. I will do that. I will answer it in, in writing completely. And thank you all very much for the questions and the discussion today and the extra time. I appreciate thank that you. so much. Excellent. Thank and you. thank you committee for 
being you, thank you. So flexible. Thank you. Have a would, good, would evening. Have a good evening. Would you please copy us all with that answer? Absolutely. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.